Well, welcome to November. Uh, for those of you who are keeping count, 53 days of shopping left until Christmas. Uh, this season of radical giving. And that's actually what we're talking about this morning, not shopping, but radical giving. We've been in a series, this is our last Sunday in the series, titled You Are Here. And what we've been talking about for five weeks now is how God takes us from where we're at and he stretches us and grows us and transforms us. We've been talking about five different ways that God stretches and grows us. We talked about daily practices. We talked about solid relationships. We talked about practical serving. We talked about tough circumstances. And this morning we're going to talk about radical giving. And I just want to take a moment of personal freedom to say it is such a joy and a privilege to pastor a church who loves to give radically. Uh, that's reflected in our budget. It's reflected on you. It's just we, we give radically. That's been the history of Aldersgate from its beginning. But, but God's always wanting to take us to a deeper place, to a new place, and stretch us. And this morning we're going to hone in on, on how God stretches us through radical giving. I believe the church should look that way. Uh, I believe if we go back to the beginning in the book of Acts, we will see that the early church, the first church, was known for its extravagant generosity, its radical giving. And so I believe that's exactly where the church should be. And in fact, I want us to start there this morning. So if you have a Bible, open it up to the book of Acts. If you didn't bring one with you, you'll find one there in the seats in front of you. Just pull it out, and I'm going to help you out. You'll go to page 839. You might have brought your phone or your tablet or whatever. Listen, I'm going to be all over the place today. We're going to be in several different places in Acts. I'm going to go over to uh, 1 Timothy. I'm going to end up in James. And so just keep your Bible or your phone or whatever open or just a piece of paper where you can jot these down and go and look them up this week. But I want to start in the place of the early church and how it was known for its radical giving. Here's what you need to know about Acts. In the New Testament... There are four books that start it called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each one of those books is a story of Jesus' life, his, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. They're all told from a little different perspective. And then the next book in the New Testament is the book of Acts. Acts is like a history book, if you will. And it tells us about the beginning of the church and how the gospel of Jesus Christ spread throughout all of these places and how the church uh, spread the gospel. In the very first chapter of Acts, we see that Jesus is going to ascend back into heaven. He gives this message to his disciples to wait for the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, the church was empowered to spread the gospel. And as they did that, that was their mission. As they went about their mission, we see that they picked up several other characteristics. So if you're there in Acts chapter 5, I want you to go back to Acts chapter 2. If you're on your phone, just flip back to Acts chapter 2, and I want us to look at starting in verse 42, because we get a very descriptive picture of the early church and what the early church was like. And here's what it says. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. And they, talking about the church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now take just a minute. It's up here on the screen for you if you don't have it in front of you. And look through the description of the early church and you tell me, do you see daily practices? Yes, you do. Do you see solid relationships? Yes, you do. Do you see practical serving? Yes, you do. Do you see tough circumstances? Maybe not. If you keep reading in chapter 3, they were arrested for preaching the gospel. Do, do you see uh, to, uh, uh, radical giving? Yes. You see all of these things that God uses in our lives today to stretch us and grow us, you see them in the early church as well. I'll give you another picture of it. Flip over to Acts chapter 4. Uh, start reading in verse 32 with me. This is another description of the early church. It says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. This is another example of radical giving. 
And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levi, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Follow me here, okay? Keep going to chapter 5. But... A man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. Now, I know you don't have the words up on the screen, but let me tell you what this means. He died, okay? And great fear... (laughs) Came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. And after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. Now, we're going to stop there because I think this would be a good time in today's service to take up the offering. And so I'm going to ask those who are going to be assisting with the offering to come forward. I'm I'm really just joking. If you're assisting with the offering, you're not this morning. Listen. Uh, this may be the best news you've heard. We're not even going to take up an offering today like we normally do as we have ushers come forward and they grab baskets and they pass the baskets out to you. Listen, here's how we're going to take the offering up this morning. On your way out, you're going to have so much opportunity. You'll hear more about that later. But on your way out, there's baskets at the back doors. They're always there every Sunday. You can leave your offering in that basket. You can also give online. You can go to your church app, Aldersgate. It's just in your app store. It's just Aldersgate. You can give there. There are lots of different ways that you can give. You don't have to put it in the basket when it's passed in front of you every Sunday morning. So we're not even going to do that this morning. We're going to let you take care of that later this morning. But what I want us to do is I want us to look at this incredible story out of Acts and what it teaches us about God stretching us through radical giving. In the book of Acts, the book of history about the early church, in chapter 5, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, it is the first place in Scripture, the first place in all the history of the early church that a sin is recorded. It's the very first sin recorded in the early church. Now, I'm not saying it's the first that happened. I'm saying it's the first that's recorded in the Bible. And because Ananias and Sapphira sold their land and they brought half of the proceeds and left the other half to themselves. Now listen, you need to hear this. Hear this. The first sin in the early church was attached to a love of money. The the first sin in the early church was attached to greed. Do you know what greed is? Greed is the false assumption that everything God blesses with us, us with, is for us to use for our own selves. That, that's greed. That everything God gives us, we would use for ourselves. And the first sin in the early church is attached to that love of money and to greed. But listen, the first sin in the early church has nothing to do with the gift that Ananias and Sapphira didn't give. You see, it was attached to a love of money, and it was attached to greed. But nowhere in Scripture are we told that when they sold something, they had to bring all the proceeds to the church. They brought half. Listen to me. Any church would gladly receive half of the proceeds from a sale of land or a house. 
I would receive it today. If you got it, just bring it on up here, all right? Any church would be happy with that offering. The love of money, what, the, the love of money wasn't the sin. The greed wasn't the sin. It was attached to that sin. You see, here's what the sin was, is that they misrepresented the truth. Peter, through the power of the Holy Spirit, knew that all the proceeds they brought wasn't all the proceeds, that they had kept half for themselves. And Peter said, Ananias, is this all the proceeds from the sale of your property? And Ananias said, yes, it's the sale of all the proceeds. You see, he misrepresented the truth. And here's what you need to hear. A love of money and greed leads to a misrepresentation of the truth. Always. In fact, the biggest reason we misrepresent the truth in our lives is because of love of money or because of our attachment to our valuable things or to our material possessions or whatever it is. That's what leads us to a misrepresentation of the truth. And that's exactly what happened here with Ananias and Sapphira. I'll show it to you another place in Scripture. If you still got your Bible or your phone or open or whatever, go, open to, the, go to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, if you're on your phone, in your Bible, or whatever. If you're still in your Bible, you don't have to get to 1 Timothy. Keep going right till you find it. If not, go back to the table of contents, and it'll tell you what page to turn to. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says this in verse 17 and 18. I'll also put it up here on the screen for you. As for the rich in this present age, that's all of us, by the way, okay? As for the rich in this present age, charge them... Not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share. Did you see it there in Paul's encouragement to Timothy as he tells Timothy this is what he's supposed to teach to the church? He's saying, listen, teach them that the love of money will help them in a bad way, misrepresent the the truth in two ways. Number one, it gives us a false sense of self-worth. And number two, it gives us a false sense of hope. That's what the love of money does. That's what greed does. It gives us a false sense of self-worth, and it gives us a false sense of hope. Let me break those two down for you. It gives us a false sense of self-worth. We begin to attach our worth to our estate or our bank account or our savings instead of to the worth that God says comes from him and him alone. It's subtle. We don't often pick up on it, but it's real easy for it to happen. Let me give you some stories to help illustrate it. When I was a little boy, we used to go to the department store called Anthony's in Milshew, Texas. Anybody remember Anthony's? And at Anthony's, they sold these shoes called Fastbacks. And every once in a while, my mom would load my brother and I up, and we would go to Anthony's. This was the only time we really loved going with her, by the way, was when we got to shop for ourselves. But we would go, and we would get new Fastbacks. And they were called Fastbacks because they made us run fast. And we were so excited to have new fastbacks. I remember putting those things on my feet. I'd get home and I'd say, look, Dad, look how faster I can run now. Because I was wearing fastbacks. The day came, I don't know exactly when it was, probably late elementary, early middle school, when I discovered brand names. Fastbacks would no longer cut it. And so, guys, can I just speak to you for a second? Ladies, you're on your own here for a minute, but guys, you'll probably relate to this. Can you remember that moment when you got that brand new pair of shoes? And you remember they had that little emblem stitched on the side of them? You know what I'm talking about? The the swoosh. You remember that? And you were so proud to own those shoes You were so excited. You couldn't wait to put them on and go to school the next day. And as you put them on and went to school the next day, you were walking through the hallway and you knew everybody was looking at your shoes, but you didn't know. You didn't want them to know that you knew that they were looking at your shoes because you were cool, weren't you? Do you see how subtly it happens? We begin to attach our worth to stuff. You see, whether it's the shoes that we wear The car that we drive, the house that we live in, it gives us a false sense of value. Come on, let's just be real. 
The more expensive the shoes, the nicer the car, and the bigger the house, the more worth we have, right? That's what our culture tells us. It's a bunch of baloney, but that's what they tell us. I remember also when I was a boy, uh, we, we, our, the first car I can remember, the family car, was a Buick station wagon. Anybody have one of those? Yeah, sorry for you. But we had a Buick station wagon as well. But that was before I knew that Buick station wagons weren't cool, right? And so I didn't care. It was an awesome car. I remember the day we traded off the Buick station wagon. We got a Suburban. This is the mid-'80s, right, the best decade ever. We got a Suburban. Back then, Suburban, I mean, that was the coolest car you could own. I mean, now when I go back and look at a mid-year Suburban, I'm like, man, it looks like something the Army should own. But back then... It was a cool car, and I remember getting that Suburban, and man, our family was proud of that Suburban. But I remember that we, we lived five miles outside of the big city, and I lived seven and a half miles from school. And so that was a lot of trips. Mom worked in town. That was a lot of trips back and forth to town, a lot of trips back and forth to the school. And Dad didn't like how much gas the Suburban used to do that driving. You know, because back then it was like $1.20 a gallon or whatever. And so... He came up with this brilliant idea that we should get a car that would be more fuel economic. And so he went in search of a car that would be more fuel economic. And somewhere in town, I don't know who he found it from, but he found a Dodge Dart. <laughs> this was the ugliest, most atrocious thing I had ever seen in my life. He paid $500 for it. And back then, that was a lot of money for this piece of crap. I'm telling you right now. It was yellow, but I don't mean hot rod yellow. I mean mustard yellow, like someone ate mustard and threw it up. That's how ugly <laughs> this car was. Two-door, I hated this car, but the Suburban was parked in our driveway, and we would drive that ugly car back and forth to town and back and forth to school. Now, listen, I knew brand names. So about a mile from the school, I'd say, Mom, this is cool. Just drop me right here. <laughs> because we attach worth to our stuff. You see, Paul said to Timothy, to those who are rich in this present age, which is all of us, don't let them be haughty. Here's what he's saying. Don't let them be prideful in a false sort of way. Don't let them take pride from the material possessions that they have because that's what money does to us. It gives us a false sense of self-worth. And when we live with that false sense of self-worth, we misrepresent the truth because that's not the truth that Jesus speaks to us. We don't even realize it and we're misrepresenting the truth. And that was the first sin in the early church. It also gives us a false sense of hope, you see, because we begin to put our hope in our estate and not in God. That's what he says here. Nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Listen, let's just be honest again. It's a great day to be able to take at the end of the month, pay your bills, take care of all the uh, uh, requirements that you have to take care of, and to have extra money left, right? That's a great deal of hope. And there's nothing wrong with paying your bills and taking care of all the requirements you have and having extra money left. The problem is when we get to put the hope in those riches. You see, Paul said to Timothy, you can have hope and you can have riches, but you can't have hope in riches. Instead, our hope should become from the one who richly provides, not in what he richly provides but in the one who provides it. There's a story that's gone around forever. It's an old joke that pastors tell about a man named Joe. Joe came to his pastor and said, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. And the pastor said, well, of course, I'd love to pray for you. What's going on? What can I help you with? How can I pray for you? And he said, it's about my tithe. Now, if you're lost there, let me just fill you in for, for a second, okay? I don't have time to go through all this biblically this morning, but a tithe biblically in the Old Testament and New Testament is giving back 10% to God from what he gives us that we bring the tithe into the church. And then there's offerings. So if we want to give above and beyond that 10%, we give offerings to wherever God lays on our heart to give. And so Joe comes to his pastor and says, I'm having a hard time tithing, giving that 10% back to the church. And the pastor says to him, well, what's the problem? And he says, well, here's the deal. When I made $50 a week, it was pretty easy to give $5 to the church. 
When I made $500 a week, it was pretty easy to give $50 to the church. But pastor, now I'm making $5,000 a week. And I'm really, really having a hard time giving $500 a week to the church. Will you, will you pray for me? Will you help me? And the pastor said, sure, let's pray. Father God, I pray that you return Joe's income to $500 a month so he'll have an easier time tithing. <laughs> Listen, the truth of the matter is the more we have, the more hope we put in it. Don't deny it. It's the truth. It gives us a false sense of of hope. John Wesley used to say, when I find myself with money, I get rid of it as soon as I can so it doesn't find a way into my heart. Because that's what money does to us. And instead of being thankful for what's provided, we put hope in it instead of hope in the one who provides, you see? And what God is saying through Acts chapter 5 and Timothy here is that we're not to have a false sense of hope. We're not to have a false sense of self-worth. That just helps us misrepresent the truth about who we really were. That's what really happened to Ananias and Sapphira. And he's saying how God stretches us and grows us in not misrepresenting the truth about ourselves is through radical giving. Watch what he says. He goes on here to say, they are to do Good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. You see, that's the antidote for a false sense of self worth and a false hope is to be generous, to be ready to share, to do good works. That's what God tells us, allows us to be stretched and grown to the point we stop misrepresenting ourselves and misrepresenting the truth. Like I said at the onset, it's a great privilege and a joy to pastor a church who understands the concept of extravagant generosity, radical giving. You can see it in our budget. You can see it on things that don't hit the budget. In fact, we, we have a, a vision here at Aldersgate that for every $3 God blesses us with, we want $2 to go outside the walls of the church to share the gospel, to reach people in need. We want people, we, we know that the mission of the church has not changed. The mission of the church has always been and will always be to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. But one of the things we know from studying the early church is that people were attracted to the early church because they were extravagantly generous. They were radical givers and they were open to the gospel because they saw a difference it was making in their lives. It doesn't matter what culture it is or what generation it is, that hasn't changed. And people can be attracted to the gospel of Jesus Christ through radical giving. Listen, I told you, I don't have time to go into all this this morning. It's another sermon series. It's nine hours worth of preaching. Here's what I would tell you this morning. Remember what I've been saying through this entire sermon series? It doesn't matter where you're at. It matters where God wants to take you. You see, it doesn't matter if you come into this place this morning and you don't give a dime. Or if you sit here this morning and you're the biggest giver this church has, God wants to stretch you and grow you through radical giving. It doesn't matter if you start giving for the very first time and you just start at 1%. Or if you've been stuck on 10% forever and God's nudging you to give above and beyond that. God wants to stretch and grow you through radical giving. And here at Aldersgate, we're always excited to tell you about opportunities to help you do that. So this morning, I want to share with you, this is National Orphan Sunday. Most of you probably didn't know that. National Orphan Sunday, a day set aside for us to celebrate in the United States of America those who are orphans. If you go on to James chapter 1, verse 27, in fact, I think they're going to put it up here on the screen for you. James chapter 1, verse 27, it tells us that religion that is pure... And undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. The, the widows and the orphans in James' culture that he was writing to were those that were the most neglected, those that were most left out, that nobody attended to, no one took care of, and not much has changed in our culture. You're going to hear some stats here in just a minute or some more about just how rampant orphans are in our culture. And so what we're going to do today is put in front of you what we're doing as a church. You see, part of that $2 for every three that goes outside the walls of the church, what we did this last year, we had a request come to us, and we sponsored 10 children in Tanzania, Africa. In the village of Sambasha, many of you have been there. Many of you have constructed the school that's in Sambasha. We've had a long-term relationship with them. 
And, and these kids need tuition money so that they can go to school. They can receive an education. Most importantly, every day they receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. They get their medical needs attended to, and they get warm food. And, and so what we did as a church body is we sponsored 10 children in Sambasha, Africa. And so their pictures are going to scroll up here on the screen, and you can enjoy seeing them. But we're going to give you the opportunity to do the same thing today. Listen, when we talk about being radical givers and being extravagantly generous, especially in terms of orphans, many of you in this church have felt called to adopt or to foster. Many of you in this church have not felt that call. But there's still something you can do. You can sponsor a child. New Life Children's Home in Guatemala, the Children's Home in Costa Rica, uh, New Missions in Haiti. We've got several opportunities for you this morning. Some of you may not be feel called to that either, but you can pray that God would move in your heart to be a radical giver, that the church would continue to radically give, that God would stretch us and grow us so that we move away from having a false sense of self-worth, a false hope. We stop misrepresenting the truth about who we are and live into the call that God has in our lives. I was an orphan. I was an orphan. I was an orphan. I didn't know my father. I was alone. Helpless. Hopeless. I had no family. I didn't belong to anyone. To anyone. To anyone. I was an orphan. No one saw me. No one knew me. I was invisible. I was lost. I was lost. No one claimed me. No one said, he's mine. She's mine. I was an orphan. I was an orphan. I was hungry. Like all the food in the world couldn't fill me up. I was vulnerable. Unprotected, at risk, cold, tired. Tired. I'm tired. I thought I didn't matter. I thought no one cared. No one cared. I was an orphan. I was an orphan. I was an orphan. But I was found. But I was found. I was found. Someone stepped in. Someone saw me. I was sought. Pursued. Wanted. Known. I was an orphan. But now I belong. Now I belong. Now I belong. I'm embraced. A sister. A brother. I know my father. I know my father. I know my father. I was an orphan. But I am loved. At great cost. I am restored. I'm restored. And for the first time, I know that I am valued, prized, forever. 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 I was an orphan. I was an orphan. I was an orphan. We're all orphans. So I care for orphans. So I care for orphans. I was an orphan. So I care for orphans. As we begin to look at what uh, this idea of radical giving means to us here at Aldersgate, uh, what we want to do is we want to be able to put something tangible uh, in front of you. Uh, a lot of times when we talk about uh, things like this, we talk in the abstract, like, oh, I wish this would happen. This would be so cool if this happened. Uh, but this morning, we want to give you actual concrete things that you can walk away with in a way that you can make a difference. And so this morning, we have Brooke McDowell. She's going to answer a few questions uh, with some of the interaction that she has in this specific area. And so we just want to start kind of asking the question that if, if someone here at Aldersgate is feeling led to foster or to adopt, what are ways in which Aldersgate can get involved in that? Um, one huge way is our adoption assistance fund. As we all know, um, adoption is very expensive. And so out in the uh, Welcome Center, there are some pamphlets on our adoption assistance fund. And what that does is that helps people with interest-free loans and even grants for people in our church who want to um, foster or adopt. Um, and it was a huge blessing to our family, too, because uh, my husband and my son and I were able to use that to finish out some of our last um, adoption a lot of expense costs to help us um, adopt our daughter. Um, and so it's pretty awesome. So if anybody also wants to give to that fund, we welcome that um, as well. And once again, our church is amazing. Somebody did that for us. Somebody um, 
anonymously donated $5,000 to our adoption agency to help us get that little strong-willed precious baby back there. <laughs> so if you feel led to give, oh my gosh, that's an amazing way that, that people can help for sure. Absolutely. Uh, some of you may be sitting here going, whoa, that's, that's not me. I'm not there yet. I'm not at a point where I feel like I could foster or I could adopt. Um, what are some other, other ways that we can be generous as a church? Oh, there, there's lots of ways. Um, like Ryan mentioned earlier, we've got some child sponsorship tables out there, and there are actually people um, at each of the stations from the different places who have actually been to these places. So it's not just a face, guys. We've really gotten to know these kids. So visit with people at the table. They can give you more information specifically on this kiddos. But we've got a New Life Children's Home from Guatemala, and we also have Children's Home in Costa Rica and also New Missions in Haiti. So take a look at some of their pictures and see if that's maybe somewhere that you can give is is giving um, to them monthly. Um, we also have a table set up, with, which is um, some resources just from this the area. It's called LILAC, but LILAC stands for Lubbock Interagency Adoption Council. And again, if you don't feel led to foster or adopt, there's way, you know, way other, many other things that you guys can help do, different funds, different drives to get plugged in to um, those places. And one of the ways that we as a church body today um, can get plugged in, over the next four weeks, we're going to be collecting um, hygiene items. So as you leave um, both doors, you'll see um, a hygiene list. There's also going to be lists on the Welcome Center um, what we are doing is we're partner, partnering with CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates, and we are working to fill duffel bags. We're trying to fill 400 duffel bags um, for kiddos who have been removed from their home. Oftentimes it's in crazy situations, uh, very uh, rush times as well, and so oftentimes they leave with the clothes on their back and that's it. So we are trying to uh, fill these duffel bags with brushes, combs, toothbrush, deodorant, just any kind of necessities and toiletries that they need. Um, and so we are going to be collecting those items over the next four weeks with November 23rd being the last Sunday. There's going to be tubs out there each Sunday. Just drop your stuff in there. And I actually was stopped after first service, after Sunday school. One of the Sunday school classes already has said they wanted to donate X amount of dollars to help us shop for those. So um, get creative and, and help us see if we can fill those, um, fill those bags as well. Absolutely. Lots of ways in which you can radically give, but there's one thing that we can all do uh, no matter where we are in this spectrum of radical giving, and what is that? That's pray. Um, pray. <laughs> Man, this, I, I wanted to bring this box. Once, as you walk out the door, you're also going to get a card. We um, welcome, you know, more than one per family. It's great. We've got, it's good and bad that we have so many cards. Um, let me tell you what's on these cards. There's a child, um, a foster care kid that's on here. So, for example, this says, pray for Jalen, two years old, child in foster care in Region 1. For those of you that don't know, Region 1 is the Panhandle, Lubbock, Amarillo, the entire, you know, area. Um, and I just want you to see this box so you can see the cards. And this was full for first service. And um, there are four of these boxes, which is an amazing opportunity for our church to take these cards and pray for these kids. But it's also very horrific and sad to know that there's that many kids just in our area in foster care. So um, please take one or more, and um, I challenge you to, uh, you know, as a family, you know, with, with, your, with your spouse, with your kids, or whomever you, you're with, please just pray over these kids um, and really hope um, and pray over these cards that, that God will do big things in their life. And as you process what it means to radically give, and you are, are walking away from this Sunday morning kind of going, okay, how, how can we be involved? What, what is our family being led to? Uh, there's lots of ways for you to be involved. Uh, they're going to be out in the Welcome Center um, after the service that you can go and look uh, at some of these uh, sponsored kids. You can look at some of the information on fostering or adoption. Uh, you can pick up uh, one of the cards that they give you as you walk out. Uh, but we just challenge you here at Aldersgate. We want to see uh, how we can be radical and how we can give uh, in ways that begins to shape and change the kingdom of God. Uh, one of those is going to be in the Casa Hygiene Drive uh, that you're going to get information today. And like she said, over the next four weeks, we're going to be putting together these bags. Many of these kids are taken from their home with literally the, the clothes on their back. They have nothing. And this is just a simple way for us to be able to give something. And that we may sit there and say, this is small, but it's very radical to them. And so we just want to challenge you in what ways you can get involved over the coming weeks. We also want to introduce something to you that's coming up over the next couple weeks as well. Uh, and that is a new sermon series that's going to start next week. Uh, it's going to address some questions that I think we've all wrestled with. We've all 
had to process through this at some point in our life. And Ryan, over the next three weeks, is going to really try to flesh out some of these things when we talk about um, some of these hard questions that we do. So here's a little uh, promo video for that next sermon series. So as we said, that's starting next week, and we want to invite you to uh, bring friends, bring coworkers, people that might uh, have wrestled with that same question, and it's going to be a good uh, life-giving experience and how we walk through that together. But we want to challenge you as you leave this morning. Uh, number one, as Ryan mentioned earlier, uh, we didn't take up our offering as we normally do uh, because we want to be able to give you different opportunities and ways to give. And so on your way out at each of the doors, there's a basket that if you'd like to give your tithe or your offerings, as Ryan mentioned, in those baskets, you can drop it in. And then we invite you to spend some time in the Welcome Center, uh, look at the tables, ask questions, begin to search as a family ways in which God might be calling you to radically give. You guys have a wonderful day.